Hello everyone, it's Eric from Strong Medicine and Stanford University, back with a coronavirus update. Today I'll be answering what I think are currently the 10 most important questions about this virus and outbreak, covering what it is, where it came from, what to expect over the coming weeks, and ultimately what actions that you as an individual should or should not take right now. I'll be including all of our most recent discoveries. As with my, with my last coronavirus video, a big disclaimer is that information regarding the outbreak is constantly changing, which means parts of this video will necessarily become out of date relatively quickly. Let's get started. What is coronavirus? Coronavirus is actually not one virus, but rather a family of at least 23 related viruses that are subdivided into four groups. Up until now, there were six of these viruses known to infect people, the most severe of which were the SARS virus, discovered in 2002, and the MERS virus, discovered in 2012. What the media is currently referring to as coronavirus is just one newly discovered form of the virus, which is formally called Novel Coronavirus 2019, though a better name is likely forthcoming. While the Novel Coronavirus 2019 is a serious global health threat, there are other coronaviruses which cause nothing more than the common cold. I literally saw a patient with a coronavirus infection in the hospital yesterday who only needed to be admitted because it triggered an exacerbation of a chronic lung condition he already had. Having explained that, for the remainder of this video, when I use the word coronavirus, I'll be referring to just novel coronavirus 2019. Question 2. Where did coronavirus come from? Other coronaviruses, including SARS and MERS, have originated in animals. When one form of the virus jumps from an animal into humans, it's referred to as a spillover event. For example, SARS is believed to have jumped from either a bat or civet cat into humans, whereas MERS jumped from camels. The original reports out of Wuhan, China, where this outbreak started in December, or more likely late November, uh, indicated that the initial cases were associated with the Huanan Seafood Wholesale Market which sold a large variety of live, wild animals for consumption. The initial suspicion was that an infected bat came into contact with an employee at the market who became ill and subsequently infected his or her co-workers, and the infection spread from there. Uh, thinking this was the case, the market was shut down by Chinese authorities on January 1st. However, on January 24th, the Lancet published the first peer-reviewed clinical description of the infection written by doctors on the ground in Wuhan. The paper included this chart of the first 41 pa uh, patients infected. As you can see, three of the first four infected, including the very first one, reportedly had no direct contact with this particular animal market, raising serious doubts about that theory. As a virus spreads within a population, it will develop mutations. These mutations are typically of no consequence to how dangerous the virus is, but they do create something called a phylogenetic tree, which maps out the relationships between different versions of the virus. For example, here is the one for coronavirus as of January 25th. Since scientists can estimate the rate with which these mutations are occurring, they can make inferences about when the original virus entered into the first human that highly specific strain of the virus called the most recent common ancestor. The first such analysis predicted a most, well, sorry, a most likely date of December the 2nd, which uh, seems to align pretty well with the epidemiological data of the first identified case having become, uh, having become symptomatic on December 1st. So overall, while not at all definitive, it seems like there was most likely a single spillover event into the first human case in late November to account for an asymptomatic incubation period. Genetic analysis of the coronavirus suggests that, as with SARS, the original animal host was most likely a bat. How a bat in initially infected that first case, patient zero, we'll probably never know. Despite internet rumors to the contrary, it was not directly due to a person eating bat soup, since cooking an animal infected with the virus completely inactivates the virus. Question three, how big is the outbreak now? If we look at how the number of cases have grown over time and how it's spread across the globe, 
starting on January 1st, when it was believed confined to the city of Wuhan, we can see that it started off small. The official number of cases at the beginning of the outbreak were a little sketchy, but in the last week and a half, the numbers have sort of exploded. As of today, February 2nd, there are over 14,000 confirmed cases in 27 different countries. That might sound like an early phase of a catastrophic global pandemic. But consider that less than 100 of those cases are outside of China. Here's a more accurate reflection of what the geographic spread of coronavirus currently looks like as of today. Because the disease is so concentrated in just one country, it's still best to refer to this outbreak as an epidemic and not a pandemic, the latter of which would imply a large number of people being affected across multiple geographic regions of the world, which isn't the case here, at least not yet. Also, the rate of growth of new cases, which had looked exponential in mid-January, now appears to be slowing down just a bit, which is of course great news, as long as it represents reality and not problems with testing or with reporting. While there are 14,000 confirmed cases now, a complex mathematical model published in The Lancet uh, uh, two days ago um, calculated that as of January 25th, there were actually around 76,000 cases in the greater Wuhan region alone, suggesting the possibility of a very substantial underreporting problem. What is R0 and why should we care? The term R0 hasn't been discussed too much in the media, but has been discussed quite a bit on Twitter in the last week, particularly among epidemiologists. R0, also referred to as the basic reproduction number, is the average number of people a contagious individual will infect when they are exposed to a completely susceptible population. In other words, it's a single number that conveys roughly how contagious an infectious disease is. An R0 close to 1 will result in a linear growth of new cases, whereas an R0 of 2 will result in a doubling of new cases for every time period that it takes a newly infected individual to become contagious themselves which for coronaviruses are usually a few days. The estimate of R0 for coronavirus has been a moving target, but seems to be around 2.2 or so. To a mathematician, that might seem terrifying because it implies exponential growth with millions infected within two months. But consider that as of today, we're already two months into this epidemic and absolutely no one is suggesting that millions of people have already contracted coronavirus. Also, while 2.2 might seem high, the R0 for SARS had been estimated to be around 3, and for measles, is somewhere between 12 and 18. Yet neither of those diseases are ravaging the globe at the moment, for very different reasons. While on the other hand, seasonal influenza kills hundreds of thousands across the world every year, yet that has an R0 of just 1.3. So clearly R0 is not the only parameter that matters in an outbreak. How is the virus spread? The most common way for the virus to spread, as with other respiratory viruses, is via respiratory droplets. Droplets are tiny fluid particles produced by coughing and sneezing, which contain virus shed by the respiratory lining of infected individuals. So in the most obvious case, an infected person coughing into the face of another individual. This is decidedly different than airborne transmission. Again, despite many people in the media and on Twitter and on Reddit conflating these two, droplet transmission and airborne transmission are not the same. While respiratory droplets are small, they are large enough to quickly settle out of the air. So just walking through a room that previously held a contagious individual is not dangerous, even if only a few minutes have passed. Also, with droplet transmission, a plain old surgical mask is sufficient protection because you're really trying to prevent the infected person from coughing directly on your own nose and mouth. You're not trying to prevent breathing shared air. However, with, with airborne transmission, the infectious particles are so tiny that they can be suspended in the air and linger there for a while, so that just by sharing the same space as an infected individual, or even after the person has left the room, transmission is possible which is why an N95 face mask is necessary protection. They are much closer to being airtight when properly fitted and worn. 
We don't yet know for sure whether or not coronavirus can infect people via airborne transmission, but scientists currently believe it either does not happen or at most is much less common than droplet transmission. This uncertainty is why the CDC is recommending that healthcare workers wear N95 masks currently when working with possible coronavirus cases. It's out of an abundance of caution. Hopefully, we'll learn in the coming weeks that this level of precaution is unnecessary, but we'll see. Once again, don't believe what you read on Twitter about airborne transmission. Most people who are claiming coronavirus is definitely airborne. They don't understand the difference between airborne and droplet. However, there is much more evidence that the virus can be spread by touching inanimate objects that are contaminated, what doctors call fomites. So for example, an infected person coughs on their hand, grabs the door handle of a public restroom, followed a few minutes later by an uninfected person grabbing the same door handle and then scratching their nose. How long the virus can survive on a surface? Well, it depends upon the type of surface, the ambient temperature, and the humidity. We don't yet know how long coronavirus specifically can survive. But if we extrapolate from SARS, which is a very similar virus, in the worst survival conditions, the SARS virus may only last a few minutes on a surface, whereas in the absolute best survival conditions, it could be hours or even a few days. Now, in response to my last coronavirus video, there were several viewers concerned about the safety of items that they had recently ordered shipped from China. So, for example, could the virus be present on that item and survive the journey in the mail? Which is a perfectly reasonable question, but luckily the answer is no. Items shipped from China to the U.S. or to Europe, they take long enough and have enough variations in temperature en route that virus particles won't survive. So your stuff shipped from China is fine. Next, are there asymptomatic carriers? The short answer is yes, but they are probably uncommon. Hopefully they're uncommon. The best evidence we have of asymptomatic transmission comes from a case report that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a few days ago. A woman from Shanghai had visited Germany on a business trip, during which she reported feeling totally fine while attending meetings with local business partners. On the flight home to China, she began feeling unwell, and she tested positive for coronavirus several days later. What's notable here is that four other company employees in Germany developed symptomatic coronavirus infections, which must necessarily have occurred while the Shanghai woman was still asymptomatic. Even more concerning than that, of those four other employees, only two had direct interactions with her. So their infections must have been due to either fomites, or theoretically airborne transmission, or potentially the first German who was infected then had asymptomatic transmission to the others. It appears that the researchers of this particular disease cluster could not identify the mechanism of transmission. How deadly is the virus? The short answer is we don't really know. If you look at the number of reported fatalities compared to the number of confirmed cases, as reported by China at least, the case fatality rate appears to be around 2-3% which is much, much worse than seasonal influenza, but is better than SARS's 10% fatality rate and much better than MERS's 35%. However, there's very good reason to be skeptical of that number. First, in the earliest days of any outbreak, many mild cases fly under the radar undetected. So the total number of cases is much higher than officially reported, consistent with what I said a few minutes ago while fatalities, they're much easier to identify. So this would imply that the 2-3% rate is an overestimate. However, the patients who have died from coronavirus have typically died several weeks after symptom onset, which means that some patients who are current cases will eventually die, implying that the 2-3% rate may be an underestimate. And among the first 41 cases, 6 died, a mortality rate of around 15%, but with a very small sample size. So again, the bottom line is we don't know yet. Despite most media reporting that it's in the neighborhood of 2-3%, it's too early to be confident about that number. Number eight, is there any effective treatment? The short answer to that is no, 
there is no specific treatment yet known to be effective beyond what's referred to as standard care, or supportive care, that is, um, oxygen and mechanical ventilation. Antibiotics are only helpful if patients become secondarily superinfected by a bacteria on top of the viral infection, which can happen, but is likely a small minority of cases. There are a few antivirals that are being tried currently, including an ongoing randomized controlled trial in Wuhan of the anti hiv drug combination of lopinavir and bertonavir, but it will take many months before we know if there was benefit. A number of antivirals were tried during the SARS epidemic of 2002 to 2003, and in retrospect, none were helpful. Now, there are many people online touting a diverse collection of natural products that either treat and or prevent coronavirus infection. All of this, without exception, is pseudoscience and quackery. If someone tells you that vitamin C will prevent you from getting coronavirus, I suggest subsequently ignoring every other piece of medical advice that person gives you. Number nine, how bad will the outbreak get? Again, the short answer is we don't know, but we've already talked about most of the major factors that are relevant here. How contagious is it? That is, what is its R0? How much did it spread outside of Wuhan before the Chinese government instituted the late and somewhat dr draconian containment measures? How long is the incubation period? Is airborne transmission possible, and how common is it? How common is asymptomatic transmission? What is the case fatality rate? Is the current outbreak the result of a single one-time spillover event from an animal reservoir that is unlikely to happen again? Or is there a large population of infected animals that will continue to have ongoing contact with humans, making recurrent outbreaks likely as we've seen with the MERS virus. And last, how long will it take to develop a coronavirus vaccine? I've seen media reports that companies are hoping to begin human trials within three to four months from today, but vaccine development, it's a slow process. Consider that focused work on an Ebola vaccine started with the 2004 epidemic in West Africa, yet an Ebola vaccine was not FDA approved until just two months ago. If a vaccine plays a major role in stopping this epidemic, it would only be because the epidemic grew to be much, much worse than is currently anticipated. At the present time, the coronavirus epidemic is already about as bad as SARS was in 2002, and once it's all over, will almost certainly have been even worse, potentially much worse. However, consider that the WHO and CDC have been uh, learning a lot about coronavirus since SARS, and they've been preparing for this event for decades. With the huge, huge caveat that I'm not personally a virologist or an epidemi epidemiologist, my gut feeling is that this epidemic will become significantly worse than SARS, but not orders of magnitude worse, and that due to the, to the efforts of public health experts around the world, it will remain predominantly con concentrated in China. And the last question for today, what can people do to protect themselves, including what's the deal with face masks? The first thing to keep in mind is to not panic. As written very, um, as written very eloquently in a Washington Post op-ed from January the 22nd, the first victim of an infectious disease outbreak is often rational decision-making. We saw that when a case of Ebola made its way to the U.S. in 2014, and we're seeing it now. So stay calm. No serious scientist or public health expert is suggesting that coronavirus represents an existential risk to humanity. Assuming you are watching this from outside of China, since YouTube is of course blocked there, protecting yourself and others from coronavirus requires nothing more than how you can protect yourself from more commonplace respiratory viruses like the flu or the common cold. So for example, wash your hands frequently, cover your cough, Avoid touching your face with unwashed hands. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces. Keep your distance from those who appear ill. And if you are feeling ill yourself, keep your distance from other people. Now, now what about face masks? Images of Chinese residents and officials alike wearing masks have become ubiquitous in the news, and I've actually seen a quite a bit of it around here in the Bay Area. However, for those of us not in China, 
coronavirus remains very rare. So even if there are a couple of handful, uh, even if there are a handful of asymptomatic carriers walking around, wearing masks while out in the community is it's, it's simply not justified. Unfortunately, what's happening is that people are feeling anxious and they want to be prepared, which is understandable. And so they're out there buying up masks left and right. Both online and brick and mortar stores are sold out, or in some cases are jacking the price up way, way higher than normal, which creates a problem for people who need masks for other reasons. Like, for example, immunocompromised cancer patients who are trying to prevent influenza when they ride the bus. Even hospitals are starting to worry that their face mask supply will become a problem because suppliers are running low, and to be honest, because hospital employees, they're stealing them for personal use outside of the hospital. Please, please don't do this. Face masks uh, should be reserved for employees while in the hospital working with patients with contagious respiratory diseases. There is no need to wear masks while walking around town in order to, to prevent catching coronavirus. The baseline risk to the individual is so, so low. It's total overkill. So there you have my coronavirus update with 10 critical questions answered. I hope you found it helpful. Please consider subscribing as I'll be posting more outbreak updates on this channel from time to time. Future updates will talk about the effectiveness of quarantines, some about the conspiracy theories, and we'll make some comparisons to the pandemic disaster film Contagion. I'll also be in, uh, interspersing my usual videos on a variety of medical topics not related to coronavirus. See you in a few days.